Well, the Brexit vote is now a reality and we continue to get you reactions from market participants, investors, economists, uh, currency strategists uh, uh, and uh, members of the business community out here in the United Kingdom as the story progresses. Uh, and uh, the government of the United Kingdom, uh, you know, pretty much embraces new, new reality uh, and tries to work through what seems like a tough path ahead. But joining me on the show today uh, for... Um, uh, for a quick perspective on the matter and how it would impact world markets, uh, Brexit and its implications largely, Brexit and the aftermath, we have with us uh, Russell Napier, uh, a well-known market historian, uh, independent strategist at Eric, who's taken out time early in the morning to speak with us. Uh, uh, Russell, great to have you on the show. Thanks very much for taking out the time. Uh, you voted out. Uh, any regrets given uh, the kind of furore or backlash that there was? Uh, and do you think that, you know, minus, uh, you know, all, all the noise around the issue, that perhaps this is uh, the most practical way forward for the United Kingdom? Sure. I mean, uh, people have to realize why a lot of people voted out. I and mean, that was just to have a sovereign parliament, a parliament where every day I go to the ballot box, I can fire any incompetent politician. It's an important thing to be able to do. And now there isn't a politician making my laws that I can't fire. So we are now as independent as India. I think it's a wonderful day. There are huge costs. There are huge prices to pay, but there are many things in life uh, more important than money. In terms of market impact, obviously all that anybody cares about is not the United Kingdom. Uh, the questions I get asked are what's going to happen in Europe? Are there any other peoples in Europe who feel the same way, that they'd like an independent parliament and not the pulling of sovereignty? And it's crucial to say that all over the world states cooperate. They pull their interests, they cooperate. It's a wonderful thing. We all do it. We do it with India. Canada does it with India. Uh, that's different than a pulling of sovereignty. So the vote is not against Europe, the vote is against a pulling of sovereignty within Europe. So now we progress and we go forward. But the key market question is a very simple one, and that is monetary policy is seen to have failed already before Brexit. Mm -hmm. I think the Central Bank of Europe and Japan and others had got as far as they could. So the only question that really matters now is, will Mrs Merkel back down from austerity? Mm -hmm and this enforced austerity across the rest of Europe. And if we answer that question, we know a lot about financial markets in the near term and a lot about whether, uh, whether this political integration of Europe will actually succeed. Because I think without her doing that, it's going to be extremely difficult to make this political integration work for the rest of Europe. Right, but let's start off with a key concern on how uh, the situation would look like with the UK stepping out of the EU. Uh, you know, for both the parties, so, you know, there's a risk of a recession and Goldman Sachs has come out with a report saying, you know, perhaps at the, by the end of this year there would be a mild recession in, in the UK. Uh, you would see uh, uh, the GDP of uh, Europe uh, getting hit by about 0.5 to 0.7 percent. Uh, how do you look at those numbers? How do you look at the immediate, uh, you know, reaction that the economy or the backlash that the economy could face in terms of investments? Uh, and that trickling down into earnings and thereby, you know, keeping the markets under pressure. Sure, I think there's no doubt there's a negative hit from this for both the United Kingdom and Europe. Uh, and in many ways, it's likely to be worse for Europe. And I know that sounds very peculiar, but Europe already had a banking crisis building up, particularly in Italy. And this is long before the Brexit vote. I mean, people are going to blame a lot of this on Brexit, but many of these things were happening anyway. The situation in Italy is, is so severe that we can even use the word banking crisis developing there. And it's not just Italy. We look at Deutsche Bank and we look at how far its share price has fallen. Now, just to stress, all before Brexit, and of course exacerbated post-Brexit, but already happening, Credit Suisse, uh, monetary policy is failing. So the question for the United Kingdom, for, for Europe, is all the same questions. If it's not working, what do, what do we do next? Now, uh, although no one's talking about it for the United Kingdom, if absolutely necessary, we could do this large fiscal spend. Uh, the most striking thing about financial markets post-Brexit is that the yield on British government debt came down. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a country that runs a huge current account deficit. I know in India you're always worried about your current account deficit, but ours is even bigger. Not anymore. I think the situation has improved quite yeah, a bit exactly. in India. Yours is better than ours is. So, we, so one of the great concerns for anybody who voted out on these constitutional reasons is, oh my goodness, uh, we may not get as much foreign capital and yields might go up. And we don't get as much foreign capital. The sterling's adjusting, but yields aren't going up. So that leaves this option to the government uh, of uh, country to what our Chancellor says, yeah. of not doing an austerity budget but actually doing an expansionary budget if necessary. But, but Europe is much, much more difficult because the Germans have set their face against uh, expansionary uh, fiscal policy, mm -hmm. particularly at a time when the central bank is expanding its balance sheet yeah. because the combination of those two things could be called helicopter money and constitutionally the central bank is not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in the, now just because it's in its constitution that it's not allowed to do it doesn't mean to say it won't do it mm-hmm. and I'm raising the question will Germany uh, change its mind so we've got to remember there is one more policy to go to yeah. but it's not one that has been used post-war in any developed world country so it's quite a big step for everybody Donald Trump is calling the end of the European Union as we know it and perhaps the breakup of the common currency in the euro we'll talk about the helicopter money theory as well because you know that's uh, one that's gaining ground among what more ammunition uh, does do central banks world over have to tackle the situation but first and foremost do you think that this is paving the way for a, a you know deeper uh, crisis in the making which could be in the breakup of the EU it would be embarrassing to agree with Donald Trump, wouldn't it? So, <laughs> but I do agree with Donald Trump that the political union is failing. And that's not to say that there won't be a European Union, and it's not to say that there won't be a political union, but I can't see all current members being member of that political union, that some of them will also have referendums, and some of those people will also vote to end the pulling of sovereignty. I think it's fairly natural. I think what's interesting in the Spanish vote mm-hmm. is that perhaps the people who may have shifted their opinions are actually in Northern Europe, mm-hmm. And that is particularly worrying, I think, for the for the European project, mm-hmm. that it's the people in Northern Europe who may be coming uh, less keen on this. So yes, now it's, uh, I've always said this, if there were two countries having a vote on, on remaining in the political union, and one was Finland and one was the United Kingdom, Finland would be much, much more important. Right. But isn't people this a... Here, people, anybody who's voting who's in the Eurozone, mm-hmm. Uh, the, we've seen some you know, significant economic dislocation from the United Kingdom voting to leave this thing. Mm-hmm. You ain't seen nothing yet if we get a Euro member voting to leave. And just one final point on that. Uh, it is imp- I think it is important that if people get a right to vote in Europe, capital will be moving all over the place if there's a, if there's a Euro member having this vote. I think they would put in exchange controls. Mm-hmm. I think some restriction on the free movement of capital mm-hmm. while the people exercise this really crucial, important constitutional decision is like, so for, so for financial market participants, mm-hmm. that would be everything. You know, whether the economy is going up or down is not important yeah. if they're putting on exchange controls. So as this democratic process works itself out to see what the union is, then I think some form of restriction on free movement of capital is likely. Right, but uh, Russell, isn't there a lot of if, uh, but, if, but uh, on that situation? Because you don't know how leadership uh, would, uh, uh, you know, shape up in the United Kingdom, what that would mean, whether there would be, uh, you know, another round of general elections. What would that do for, uh, uh, you know, the vote of the public and the thought process that there is in lieu of the backlash that we've had to the out vote? And, you know, how that would then influence under the new leadership the ties with the European Union. It could well happen that, you know, uh, the, the trade agreements and the nature of the relationship could be just another chapter in the same book. So you might go back to square uh, square one six months down the line, especially if Article 50 is not invoked. And it doesn't seem like the UK government. What I'm trying to, uh, you know, highlight is that uh, it's not done and over just as yet. So do you think that the market reaction from here on would be one which is calibrated, unless there is some bad news staring at you in the face uh, in terms of a complete breakdown of the machinery, things would be okay, the markets would stabilize. Yeah, I don't think the market's going to be in the least bit concerned about the United Kingdom. It's only ever going to be concerned about Europe. And the United Kingdom has a currency which will take most of the pressure. It could have a recession. It has an independent central bank, well capable of dealing with any liquidity issues in the banking system. The banking system is effectively owned by the state. There'll be pain. It'll adjust. The market is only concerned about Europe. And and so what you've said to me, I'm afraid, is even more complicated than that. It's not just we'll have political changes underway in one party that's in the negotiations. We'll have it underway in the other one, which is the European Union. So there is really a a feasible outlook that two years from now we begin to complete the process of negotiation with something that looks more like a European common market than a European political union, and that would go back to the to voters. I think what could easily happen is that in two years from now we go back to voters and say, you voted against the political union, mm-hmm. but this thing is changing more towards a common market, okay. and we'll have a second vote. And we've made, we've done this specific deal with this organization, mm-hmm. uh, and would you endorse that? So that, that is definitely possible, but it's not within six or nine or 12 months. Mm-hmm. It's going to have to wait a couple of years for things to settle down. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.